We need what, sorry? The lights putting on. You know we're in a cost of living crisis, don't you? It's the middle of the day. Yeah, but they can't see you. Right, we've got to make this quick. We're not having these lights on for much longer than three minutes. All right? Okay, right, let's go. Be quick. Come on, be snappy. Hello, good day. My name is Penny Pinching Pete. I am the chief financial officer for Renada. Um, what we're going to talk through today is how Renada makes all their money. Um, and specifically, how you at your MSP can be just as financially lucrative as Renada. And it is my job here as Penny Pinching Pete to ensure Renada is at all times efficient, profitable, and has absolutely no bleed. But we do not sacrifice quality. So I have in front of me here my tablet, um, 2005 iPad, but it works perfectly fine. Um, and one thing we know at Renada is, is if we put a graphic on the screen, if you will, please, um, the less you spend, the more money you make over time. So our aim at Renado is to make loads of money. So I'm just going to run through our expenses each month. At the top, we have obviously essentials. So we have Microsoft Business Basic licenses, AVG, Antivirus. These two products together are just best in class. Hot water, we provide the team hot water. Air conditioning, that just got removed in it. We only have two hot days a year. We don't need that. Sip. What the hell is sip? Let me try and find someone in my team to ring. I don't, just, sorry, hold the, hold the recording. Sorry, wait there, sip. Sip, okay. Hello, Jacob, yeah. I'm um, just going through our finances this month and um, I see we have a product on there called Sip. It's a multi-tenant, blah, blah, blah. Listen, I don't care. Connor has clearly said he wants a Ferrari this quarter. I get it, but... We've done the time tracking video. Now we're doing the finances. I want it squashed immediately. You clearly didn't watch the top 10 features video, did you? I didn't watch the top 10. I don't care. We have for years managed Office 365 without needing another piece of software. You can just go and log into the tenant with a global admin account, reset the users, make new ones. It is perfectly fine. We don't need another tool on top of a tool. Okay, thank you. Okay, bye bye bye. bye. Sorry about that, everyone. We've got to cut this short, unfortunately. Bit of a problem with Renado at the minute. I won't get into the long and short of it. It's really important that you keep an eye on what you're spending your money on, because if not, your team will just buy crap they don't need. We've, we've got to cut the cameras, cut the lights. We've got to got to sort this out. To be fair. Connor did actually have a great question, and probably the same question that many of you have. Why pay for SIP when you already have the Microsoft Partner Portal and or direct tenant access? What's the point of adding another layer when Microsoft gives us everything we need for free? Well, strap in. By the end of this series, you'll see how SIP is going to transform how you manage your clients, and Connor might get that step closer to his Ferrari dream through all the time that we save. <laughs> Okay, so this series is meant to be a day in the life set of videos where I teach you how to use SIP and this video specifically is day zero of our SIP journey. And it's day zero for a reason. Before you can make use of SIP to its full potential, you need a goal. And it's all well and good using SIP for the new fancy UI or because someone told you it was good, but that doesn't help anyone. If we have a goal or a problem, we can make the most effective use of SIP possible. For example, end user verification is a common problem for many MSPs. Someone calls up, you haven't spoken to them before, you can't verify that it's actually them calling. Well, now you can. Let me show you something. Okay, so we go into SIP, we set our tenant, we go to identity management administration, and then users got a full list of users in our portal. If we hover over a user, so in this case, let's go with Bob Bobkins, I've got the three dots. When I click on them, I've got a whole list of options I want to use. Or additionally, I can go to the user themselves, hitting view user, it will load up that user specifically. And then I've got the actions button, which is more or less the same. There's a button you'll notice here called send MFA push. And this is going to be what we use to verify our user. Effectively, we're agreeing or assuming that the device that this user has that they use for their MFA is with them. It's their device and they're the one that's going to be confirming this and therefore identifying themselves. So through the UI, obviously, if I hit send MFA push, I hit confirm. That's going to send a request to the registered MFA device for this user. Um, if I double check my phone, I see there's a sign in to approve. So let that get my face. I'll hit approve and look at that. We've got a successful MFA confirmation. So outside of that confirmation, that's all this button does. But if you use that in a workflow, you can get a whole lot more specific. I know I said enough halo and that is true. But for this specific use case, I've built the example in our sandbox. 
So if I'll jump over there and I'll show you exactly how you can make even more use of, of a simple button in SIP like this. If I go to my service desk, I've got a ticket, which is a test ticket. And uh, it's because I can. Connor couldn't stop me if he tried. Okay, so you'll notice there's a verify user button at the top of my list here. If I hit that, it's going to give me a new action where I can verify user. And this time, let's go with Joni Sherman. If I hit save on that after selecting them, it's going to send an MFA push to the user and it's going to tell me about that. So they should receive it in the next five seconds. Again, Joni is one of the ones that I have configured myself. OK, and if I check my phone, that should be there and it is. So I'll hit approve, send to my face and it's accepted it. And we should get an update on the ticket in a second. And there we go. So success. So the MFA push was sent to the user for their Microsoft Authenticator configured device. They've approved it and the ticket's been updated with that success. So as a technician, I could now say, OK, cool. I know that that is the user I'm talking to. Let's go ahead and do whatever they wanted, whether or not that's a password reset or some other form of action or advice even. We're good to go. And this is just a basic step. So let's do the same thing again. Oh, not reassign. I want to verify. I'm going to search Joni again i'm going to hit save and this time i'm going to decline the request so let's just wait for that to come through okay so that request has come through i'm going to hit deny this time and we should have confirmation it's like here we go we've got an error so authentication failed does that have it configured so we could change this message if we wanted to but just for this testing purpose it's just effectively an error we're not happy with this it was denied whatever no longer work with this person we don't know who they are and that's the workflow there so i'll give you a, a quick little insight into it just so you can see exactly what we're looking at here we've got the end user verification run book. If I go to the flow chart, it's pretty straightforward. We're getting some detail on the action that we're doing. So when we verify the user, we've got a action level field for verifying the user, which is just a SQL lookup. It's populating that information. And then at that point, we're obtaining the information from that field using the ticket ID key of the action ticket ID and the action ID from the actions endpoint. And then we're outputting the halo ID of that user from that custom field, which is part of the SQL lookup. We can then move to the next step of user detail, which is just a Halo API action where we're editing the user using the ID that we got. Obviously, that's not going to change anything because it's just a post request to an endpoint with an ID. It's just going to return effectively that user and their details, which we're then outputting the Azure OID, the user's ID, their Azure tenant ID, and their email address because that's needed for the next field. If I move to the MFA push step, it's the same as what we did in the SIP portal. We're just replicating it through the API. If I edit this method, we're gonna see it's the exec send push endpoint. Um, and the body is the tenant filter. So the tenant ID of the user. Um, and their email address, which is the email address that we're verifying effectively. And then that links to the MFA device they have configured. Um, if I move to the next step again, we've got the create action, which is where we're doing a HTML check to actually create the action after it's been approved. And this is based on a couple of variables that were output, which I'll go back and show you again are the output variables of MFA push result and MFA state. So the result is the actual text that we're doing there. And if I wanted to, like we said, I could map the values to different things um, based on specific outputs. And I'm sure there's some more information that we could get based on why it was declined um, or why there was an error and what more specifics that was. Um, for this use case, we haven't bothered. And then the MFA push state is obviously whether or not it's an error or success. And I've mapped these two capitals just based on the HTML I've used um, to generate the action information for us. They, they map to specific capitalized information and then generate the card with that information as well based on the push state here. And that's pretty much it. It's, it's quite simple. Um, but very effective for MSPs, I think. Okay, so that's the runbook in Halo, and not by any means are you required to use Halo to do things like this. Um, all of the requests 
that, that we're rebuilding in our runbook in this environment are using the SIP API. So if you've got the API enabled, which if you don't, you can contact support and get them to enable it for you. If you're hosted, obviously that is. If you're self-hosted, there is a bit more config, but you can find all that on the SIP documentation. Effectively, once you've got that API access, you can recreate these same requests, whether or not it's through Postman, Halo Runbook, something like NAN workflows. This configuration is definitely possible for you to replicate this configuration in your own environment. Whatever tool or product you choose to use is up to you, but this is a really good feature that SIP offers that will really just encapsulate that that goal and that problem solving atmosphere that SIP is meant to be and it should help you now and into the future. This is just a small example of what we can achieve with SIP, the API and a goal. We had a problem we needed to fix and using the API and a small workflow we've managed to solve it. In the next video we're going to dive into standards. This is the feature that will help ease the configuration of all your clients with your set of gold standard settings. However for now that's it. I'm out.